Welcome to Calvary Bible Baptist Church, those of you that are watching and those of you that are here. We're doing our Bible study through the book of Genesis. Uh, through the book of Genesis, we're going to look at today, we're going to look at the blood. And um, I will warn you, the Bible is a bloody book. And a lot of people have a problem with it. And it generates from the uh, spiritual aspect. And um, it's quite interesting because we live in a day and age where there's a lot of violence, more violence now than probably ever was before, and definitely more violence that's pictured in media. News stations want to show violence and blood and gore, movies, and people want to see the bloodiest and goriest things, yet when we talk about the blood, people shy away and people get nervous and people don't like it because it's spiritual. And the Bible is a very bloody book, and we're going to get into that, and if you feel queasy, have to walk out or something, I'm not going to take offense to it, but the Bible is going to talk a lot about blood. And uh, if you would, let's go to Genesis chapter 9 this morning. Genesis chapter 9, verses 1 through 3. <clears throat> and we'll start reading. Genesis chapter 9, verses 1 through 3. And God blessed Noah and his sons, and said unto them, Be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. Let's open with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for saving our souls. If there's anybody in here that doesn't know what the, it means to be saved, to be born again, Lord, I pray that you'd uh, prick their hearts, Lord, convict them uh, to repent of their sin and to put their faith and trust in you this morning, that today would be their day of salvation. Lord, I pray for those that are saved, that you bless their Bible study, Lord, that it would be edifying. I pray that you'd speak this morning, that um, what you'd want to be said would be said, Lord, and that you'd put me aside and uh, put my flesh aside, Lord. I pray that uh, your word would speak to the hearers this morning. I pray for the message to come. I pray for the, uh, tonight's message as well, Lord. I pray for each and every one of the saints here this morning. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. And it says, And God bless no one his sons, and said unto them, Be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, and upon every fowl of the air, and upon all that moveth upon the earth. Upon all the fishes of the sea, into your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb. Have I given you all things? And last time we concluded about this Bible study on eating meat. The Bible has permitted us in this day and age to eat meat. And uh, you say, it's kind of strange that you're harping on that. Uh, you don't have to eat meat, but you can't tell someone that they can't. And if you do, you're wrong by, scrip you're wrong by God. You're wrong by Scripture. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 4. For every... For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. And if you give thanksgiving, that's why I recommend before every meal, you say grace. You, you, you say a prayer to bless the food, because it's God that's giving you that food, amen? And it's not of our own will and our own strength. And you know what? I look in, across America when I go out to food places, and I find very few people saying grace anymore. We're an unthankful culture. We're an unthankful uh, people. We're so filled with food that we're not even thankful for it anymore. Oh, we just take it for granted. I'm going to get a meal. Uh, I bet you some of you right now, me too, you know, we're hungry. We can't wait for this afternoon. We're just going to get a meal, and we know. And there's places in this world where people don't have food. And they won't find food for a while, and some people will still starve. It's few and far between. Most of the world is overfed, but there's still parts of this world where there are people starving. And yet we just take it for granted. We're going to feed. We're going to have food. But the Bible says here that every creature of God is good. There's an old shirt that had a quote, and I like it. It says, there's a place for all of God's creatures next to the mashed potatoes and gravy. Amen. And that's biblical. And anybody that tells you not to eat meat for any particular reason, they don't know they're against God. You say, why are you harping on this? Because in the latter days, people are going to abstain from meats and command it. 1 Timothy 4.1, one. 
Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, we're living in the latter times, folks, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. All right, people are departing from the faith. We've seen that firsthand. Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. There's doctrines of devils all throughout this world. And in that context, look at verse 3. Forbidding to marry. Okay, that's starting to happen. And, to, and commanding to abstain from meats. All right, they're going to command to, they're going to tell you, abstain, don't have, don't partake, don't have anything to do with meat. Which God has created to be received with thanksgiving. There it is again. Of them which believe and know, see, here it is. Them which believe and know the truth. And the truth is what makes us free. The problem is people can't receive the truth. The truth of the scriptures. So in the latter times, they're going to forbid to marry. They're going to for, uh, command to abstain from meat. For whatever reason, I don't know. You know, they had that mad cow disease that went out. The chronic wasting disease that's been some... They might abstain you from eating meat for some health reason. I don't know. Maybe the government will get so powerful enough to tell us that, you know, not to eat meat because it's bad for our health. And people will believe it. You say, is that definitely the way it's going to be? Well, I don't know how it's going to be, but I wouldn't dismiss it. So in the latter times, they're going to forbid to marry. They're going to command from abstaining uh, from meat, which are to be received with thanksgiving. Now, I didn't give the scripture verses, but in the, in the millennium, all right, in the millennial reign, like in the garden, the Garden of Eden, they didn't eat meat. They were given every green herb. And if you look in Isaiah, it says that in the millennium, the, the lion will lie down with the lamb and they'll eat straw. But that's not today. You try to feed a lion straw today, and you try to make a lion lay down with a lamb today, it's not going to work out for that lamb. <laughs> You're going to have lamb chops because it's not the right time. And people, they don't rightly divide. You want to know a lot of doctrinal errors come from the scripture? people that don't rightly divide. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly in latter times. So in the latter times, they're going to ex- they're going to say, don't you eat meat. Alright. Now on to the next Bible. Any questions on that? Any questions on that Bible study? Genesis chapter 9, verse 4. <clears throat> but the flesh or the life thereof which is the blood thereof, shall you not eat. So here we're, we're told, and you said before that we can eat animals, we can eat all of God's creatures, uh, our, our animals. They're to be received, and to be received with thanksgiving. And you can eat animals, but you can't eat it with its blood, okay, or drink the blood. Leviticus chapter 17, verse 13. This is in the law now. This is the Levitical law. The Old Testament Levitical law was the law given by God through Moses to man. And here it says, Leviticus 17, 13, And whatsoever man there be of the children of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn among you, which hunteth and catcheth any beast or fowl that may be eaten, he shall even pour out the blood thereof and cover it with dust. So you're not supposed to eat that blood, you're not supposed to eat the flesh with the blood, and you're supposed to separate that blood, you're supposed to pour it out. Leviticus chapter 7, verse 26. Leviticus chapter 7, verse 26. Moreover, you shall eat no manner of blood, whether it be a fowl or a beast in any of your dwellings. Whatsoever soul it be that eateth any manner of blood, even that soul shall be cut off from among his people. So you were commanded in the Old Testament, in Levitical law, you're not to eat blood. You're not to eat the flesh with the blood, and the blood's to be drained and to be cast out and covered with dust. So much so that if you do eat the flesh with the blood, that your soul is in jeopardy, cut off. Leviticus chapter 17, verse 10. And whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel, of the strangers that sojourn among you, that eateth any manner of blood, I will even set my face against that soul. God's against that him. God's against that soul. He's not just, he's against him. I will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood and will cut him off from among his people. All right, so God says, I'm going to set my face against him. Now, we're saved by grace through faith, and God is not our enemy, amen? 
God becomes the enemy of people that don't follow his law in the Old Testament. I can't fathom that, God being nice. When I was lost, the Bible says that we were an enemy, that we were an enmity of God, we were enemies of God. But God says, you, that blood, and you violate that law, I set my face against you. That's pretty severe, folks. That's pretty, that's pretty, uh, um, that's pretty real. Leviticus chapter 3, verse 17. It shall be a perpetual statute for your generations throughout all your dwellings that you eat neither fat nor blood. So we can see through the Old Testament, before the law and during the law, that blood eating and blood drinking was forbidden uh, to be taken at all by the Jews, by the men and ladies and women of God orally. Even in the New Testament church age, for Christians, this is important, this is talking about us now, it is still enforced as to not eat or drink blood. Acts chapter 15, verse 20. Now we're not under law, but this is what it says. But that we write unto them that they abstain. Remember how in the latter days they're going to abstain from meat? They're going to tell us not to eat meat. Well, this is what you're supposed to abstain from. That they abstain from pollutions of idols, from fornication. That's rampant in America today. And from things strangled and from blood. So that blood is forbidden to be ingested or taken in by humans throughout the Old and New Testament by God. Acts chapter 15, verse 29. Look down to verse 29 of the same chapter. That ye abstain from meats offered to idols, from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, which if you keep yourselves, you shall do well. So it says here that if you as a Christian keep from these things, and one of them being blood, you'll do well. And it's interesting because there's a lot of sects and cults out there that do things with blood. They mess around and take in blood. Cannibalistic societies that take in blood. And God says, that's not right, that's not good, that's wrong. In the Old Testament was a death sentence. Today it's looked down upon by God. Because of this passage, you know that Jesus Christ, he speaks of this, of eating and drinking his blood. Go to John chapter 6, verse 52. John chapter 6, verse 52. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give, give us his flesh to eat? Verse 53. And Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Verse 55, For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. So we see here that Jesus Christ says and talks about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. Uh, because of the previous passage in Acts, we know that Jesus Christ had to be talking spiritually because it's obviously unlawful to eat and drink literal blood. And Jesus clarifies this. Look at John chapter 6, verse 63. This is shortly after he talks about eating and drinking his flesh and blood. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So God's saying, Jesus Christ is saying that I'm, what I'm speaking to you is spirit. It's not, this part is not literal. Rule of thumb, when you're, take, when you're reading the Bible, you take everything literal where it can be, and you don't take it literal where it's impossible to be. Pretty straightforward. This passage is a spiritual passage, not literal. If you're in this passage, you wouldn't take it literally. So you didn't. Jesus Christ wasn't talking about physically eating his body and physically drinking his blood. Jesus Christ knows that in the Old Testament it was a death penalty and in Acts chapter 15, New Testament doctrine is still looked down upon. He's talking about spiritual things. You want to know something? Many people left him because of this saying. They just left him. They didn't ask him what it meant. They just said, we can't do that. And they left. Jesus Christ isn't all... Jesus Christ wants to bring all people unto himself, but when it comes to who really wants him, he's willing to leave people at the door 
that don't want him. He wants people that want him. And people, they didn't want him. They, don't, they didn't want to know what he meant by that. And so they just went right on their way. And Peter says, where are we going to go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Peter said something right there. We can't go any, we're not going anywhere, Jesus Christ. You have the words of eternal life, but John 6, 6, 6, the number of the beast, says that many people walk no more with them because of the same, eating and drinking of his flesh and blood. Now, there is a universal religion out there that does practice just this. Part two, the celebration of the Christian mysteries. In brief, 1413, by the consecration of transubstantiation of the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ is brought about under the consecrated species of bread and wine. Watch this. Christ himself, living and glorious, is present in the true, real, and substantial manner. Now pay attention to that, because that's very important, what they're trying to say about the body and blood. His body and his blood with his soul and his divinity Council of Trent, 1640 to 1651. In other words, what they're saying is that if you bring some random bread, which, by the way, they said is wheat, and they didn't ever say that it was unleavened. That's important. If you just bring some bread and you bring some wine together and you have certain people and certain rituals of certain things said, that is the body, physical, the physical body and blood of Jesus. called the doctrine of transubstantiation. So if you partake of the bread and wine at the communion, you're partaking of Christ in a substantial manner. You're literally partaking of his, you're, eat, you're literally eating his body and literally drinking his blood. Breaking every commandment in the Old Testament and New. Amen. Don't get mad at me. Go research it on your own. Religious organization does this, and they do it on a weekly basis. Sacrificing the Lord on a weekly basis. The literal body and blood. Eating and drinking the literal body and blood. That's what they believe. Magic happens. And, and, and actually, I think the uh, Latin or the Greek or something means hocus pocus. That's, that's magic. That's devilment. And that's what they do every week. They, they re-sacrifice the blood and body of Jesus Christ. Now, in Hebrews, I don't know what you read, but in Hebrews it said that Jesus was sacrificed once for all. Hebrews chapter 10. Amen? So then why are they sacrificing him every, every week? That's what they believe in their doctrine. Read it online. Read it. Uh, go to a library transubstantiation they actually have the when they have the bread and wine they have the literal body and blood of Jesus Christ Genesis chapter 9 verse 4 they're breaking every commandment of the Old Testament and new you're not to eat the bread or you're not to eat blood and you're not to drink blood when Jesus was speaking to his disciples he was speaking of his spiritual nature Genesis chapter 9, verse 4. But the flesh, or the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall you not eat. And surely, that, did, that gets rid of cannibalism. You're not to, the Bible says that if you shed man's blood, you'll require it at your hand. And there's, there's places out there where they eat other people. But the flesh, or the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall you not eat. And surely your blood... Of your lives will I require at the hand of every beast will I require it. And at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man. Look at verse 6. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. Now right there, that's the most anti-American, anti-21st century statement. God believes, amen, in the death penalty. Whether you believe in it or not, that's between you and God, but God believes in it. And God says right here, whoso sheddeth man's blood, that's murder. The shedding, the shedding of blood is different than the spilling of blood. Spilling is an accident. But when you shed someone's blood, you're purposely slaying them. Back then it was, you know, 
It wasn't with a gun at a mile away. It was up close with a sword, usually, or something that stabbed and blood gushed out. I'm sorry to say it that way, but that's the way it was. And blood was shed. People died. And God said, if you shed man's blood, your blood will be shed. And that's rejected by liberal America. Amen? The word blood occurs 447 times. And remember, I said that this book, this King James Bible, is a bloody book. And every other version of the Bible has messed with things in this Bible. One thing that they mess with is the blood. They take out the blood. Too much blood. The word blood occurs 447 times in 375 verses in the King James Bible. I'm going to reiterate, it's a bloody book. In a violent culture where we see blood and gore on a daily basis, it shouldn't be too much of a problem that there's blood in this book. Amen? But the problem is there's a spiritual, there's a spiritual problem that people have with that book and have with the blood. Blood. Blood is made up of four components. We have red blood cells, or RBCs, these are called erythrocytes. The, blood, the component of blood is red blood cells, the larger white blood cells, platelets, and plasma. So the red blood cells are called erythrocytes. These give the blood its red color and from the iron-carrying oxygen-rich hemoglobins. So the iron-rich oxygen-carrying hemoglobins in the red blood cells give the blood its red color. The white blood cells, also called leukocytes, that's where you get the word leukemia. Leukemia is the cancer in your blood. Leukemia from leukocytes. White blood cells are much larger cells used to attack or destroy pathogens. Platelets, called thrombocytes, are clotting agents used in uh, the case of an injury or cut. And it clots the blood to prevent more bleeding. Okay. The plasma of the blood is actually the liquid portion of the blood. And the plasma is the liquid part that actually is a yellow uh, straw-colored fluid. 95% of it is water, while the rest of it is our dissolved proteins. So their blood is about 7% of a body weight of a person. So a person that's about 150, 180 pounds contains about 4.7 to 5.5 liters of blood. There are four main types of blood based on the presence or absence of certain antigens. Uh, type A, AB, or type A, type B, type AB, or type O are based on the presence or absence of these two antigens, A and B. Type AB uh, blood has AB antigens allowing them to transfer or transfuse blood with another person that has AB. Only, they're only able to donate to each other, but people with AB blood can receive universally blood from anybody because they have the matching antigens of A and B. Blood comes from marrow. Type O blood is, uh, has neither A nor B antigens in the red blood cells, so it can receive blood only from other O type but it can donate to anybody. Type O is a universal donor. So blood comes from bone marrow. Um, let's see. Let me read something. Yep, so red and white blood cells along with platelets produced in the soft fatty tissue inside bone cavities called bone marrow. Um, the rhesus factor also... The rhesus factor is a protein that's either present or absent in the blood, marked by either a positive having the protein or negative not having the protein. And so those are the main classifications of blood. You got the main classifications of blood typing, and of course, whether it's positive or negative is the presence of a particular protein. This particular protein is important with blood transfusion of pregnant women, because if they 
don't have that protein and they give it to them, then there's a reaction that can kill the unborn child. Uh, Genesis chapter 9, verse 5. Genesis chapter 9, verse 5. And surely your blood of your lives will I require at the hand of every beast, will I require it. And at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. So right before the law was written, God put down that if you shed man's blood, by man shall your blood be shed. God is going to require your blood at his, at his blood, at his hand. Capital punishment for bloodshed is what God believes in. If you were to go to Exodus chapter 21, verse 12. Exodus chapter 21, verse 12. This is the law. He that smiteth a man so that he die shall surely be put to death. And if a man lie not in wait, but God deliver him into his hand, then I will appoint thee a place whither he shall sleep. That's in, called the place of refuge. But if a man come presumptuously upon his neighbor to slay him with guile, thou shalt take him from mine altar, that he may what? Die. So God isn't very politically correct. <laughs> and God doesn't have to be. These are God's laws. Leviticus 24, 17, And he that killeth any man shall surely be put to death. I think we get the idea through the scriptures that God believes in capital punishment for murder. He doesn't say it just once. He doesn't just say it twice. He doesn't even just say it three times, folks. But yet you have in America, they're trying to rule that, you know, capital punishment is cruel and unusual. Where are they getting that? They can't be getting that from the Bible. They can't be reading their, much of their Bible. For a matter of fact, they're not. Most of the laws today... Your old laws were derived from the Word of God. They were biblical. But most of your laws today are man-centered. And as they're getting rid of the death penalty, well, we'll talk about it. Numbers chapter 35. Numbers chapter 35. Right, well, go to Leviticus 24, 20. Here's another one. He that killeth a beast, and he shall restore it. He that killeth a man, he shall be put. God believes in death penalty, why don't Americans? Well, that's Old Testament. I understand that's Old Testament, but that's the laws of God. Shouldn't we be governed by the laws of God in our nation? If we're supposed to be a godly nation? Now, if you will go to Numbers chapter 35, God says something a little more about bloodshed and about the capital punishment. Numbers chapter 35, verse 30. Whoso killeth any person, the murderer shall be put to death. There it is again. I think it's hard to miss. I think when people miss it, it's because they want to miss it. It's because they reject flatly God's word. Whoso killeth any person, the murderer shall be put to death by the mouth of witnesses. It wasn't just to be done hastily without evidence, folks. God believes in evidence. God believes in forensics. They were supposed to have witnesses. Two or more. You know, you're not supposed to wrongly accuse somebody because you just want to see them die. God knows what he's doing. He's the author of law. Whoso killeth any person, the murderer shall be put to death by the mouth of witnesses. Here it is. But one witness shall not testify against any person to cause him to die. There's your circumstantial, uh, there's your, um, uh, your circumstantial evidence. There's your, uh, there's all your evidence that's um, physical. There's your biological evidence. God's all about forensics. God's all about justice. It's man that's the problem. But one witness shall not testify against any person to cause him to die. And moreover, he shall take no satisfaction, but here, here we are, for the life of a murderer, which is guilty of death. But he shall surely be put to death. You know, when we have serial killers that get life imprisonment, you know what we... You know what God's saying? That you're taking satisfaction for that. When on a reasonable shadow of doubt that person's convicted of murder and you don't execute them, you're taking satisfaction. Amen. I know this isn't a very popular Bible study, but it's the truth. God says if you have evidence against them and through due process of law, you're to execute them. They're to die. 
worldly, he shall take no satisfaction for the life of a murderer, which is guilty of death. But he shall surely put, be put to death. You want to know what's going on? Is American justice is losing its speed. Now, I'm all, I'm not for, you know, wrongfully convicted. I know there's been people wrongfully convicted and put to death. I understand that. But it's completely other, it's completely different when you have all the evidence before you and there's no doubt that they've murdered and that they don't get the death penalty. Moreover, you shall take no satisfaction for the life of murder, but he shall surely be put to death. Verse 32, and you shall take no satisfaction for him that has fled to the city of his refuge if he should come again to dwell on the land until the death of the priest. So shall you, look at, not pollute the land wherein you are, for the blood, watch it, it defileth the land. And the land cannot be cleansed of the blood that is shed therein, but by the blood of him that shed it. Defile not therefore the land which ye shall inhabit, wherein I dwell, for I the Lord dwell among the children of Israel. Notice how the land gets polluted and defiled by blood, when capital punishment of a murder isn't dealt with. Let me say that again. Notice, God says this. When you don't deal with capital punishment when it's supposed to be dealt with, when you don't execute somebody that, as a government, not as an individual, when you don't execute that person, the blood of that innocent person who was slain, their blood defiles the land. It actually literally defiles the land. It pollutes it. There's your environmentalism. I'm serious. Notice how the land gets polluted and defiled when capital punishment of a murder isn't dealt with. I don't know about you, but I think America's land is mighty polluted. High crimes and murders, most aren't even getting the death penalty anymore. But life imprisonment. And I understand life imprisonment is very important, but when you have a serial killer... There was a case where a serial killer was arrested and murdered over 48 women. 48. When his response to his arrest is, oh, okay. Without any remorse, without any uh, sorrow, and you give that man life imprisonment, thinking that he's going to dwell on that and it's going to haunt him, I have no idea the, the mindset of a serial killer. They're sociopaths. They will never care. Unless God changes them. You have to, you, you have to, and it's not murder, you have to eliminate them through the government, through due process of law. Why? So that the land is cleansed. And then you have abortion. That's another issue. Innocent life being murdered. Of unborn children that can't even cry out, that can't even vouch for themselves. I think America's land is mighty polluted. Judgment's coming, and I'm not saying it in a condescending way. It's coming because it has to come. Judgment's coming upon America. And you see here that blood is tied to the land. Blood is tied to the land. The first time blood's ever mentioned in the Bible is Genesis chapter 4, verse 10. And it's in dealing with Cain and how he slew Abel. And notice once again when we read it how the blood is tied to the land. Genesis chapter 4, verse 10. And he said, what hast thou done? That's God speaking to Cain. The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. I wonder if God's ears are pierced with the cries of many slain blood in America and the world today. God said to Cain, what hast thou done? The, the cry of thy bro brother's blood, the blood crying. I wonder today in America with the abortion that's going on, with the murders that aren't being dealt with, if, if there's blood that's crying out to God and it's piercing his ears, all the innocent blood crying out. Currently in America, there are 31 states that have the death penalty while 19 do not. There have been cases where many have been wrongfully accused and put to death. And that's wicked, and I understand that. Many murder cases, uh, although many murder cases went to life imprisonment, Because the jurors couldn't agree. You know, you have 12 jurors on a, on a, uh, 
on a trial. And if they don't all agree on the death penalty that that person is supposed to get, they don't get it. Next, God gave governments in the New Testament the right of capital punishment and the sword. Okay, Romans chapter, uh, oh, here's another verse. Matthew 23, 35, that upon you may come all the righteous bloodshed upon the earth and the blood of righteous Abel and the blood of Zacharias, the son of Berechias, whom you slew between the temple and the altar. God remembers the innocent that are slain. God remembers the innocent that are slain. Romans chapter 13, verse 4, God gives the power of capital punishment to the government. This is New Testament now. Romans 13, 4, for he is a minister of God to thee for good. Talking about government. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. Okay? Talking about the sword, the sword of execution, the sword of, of uh, uh, warfare. For he is a minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Now, God gives the power of the sword to the government, not individually. People individually that go out and try to murder and kill and do God's work and all that, they're murderers. God gives it to the government. And as much as I dis, there's a lot of things about our government that I may disagree with and I don't agree with everything of our government because, yes, it is becoming wicked and whatnot. The government has been established by God over us. We get the government we deserve. Pray about that. Don't like your government? Pray about your people. Witness. Give people the light of the gospel, the light of the word of God, so that maybe our people can change. Our government's so wicked and evil and corrupt. Well, what are you, what are you doing about witnessing to the masses? The government we get is the government that we deserve. And God has given our government the power of the sword, the power of the sword, the power of execution. Paul's response when he was on trial was that he didn't refuse to die if he deserved death. Look at this, Acts chapter 25, verse 10. Then, then said Paul, I stand at Caesar's uh, judgment seat where I ought to be judged. To the Jews have I done no wrong, as thou very well knowest. For if I be an offender, or if I commit in anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. But if there be none of these things whereof these accuse me, no man may deliver me unto them. I appeal unto Caesar. Even Paul's response is, if I've done something worthy of death, that means that there are things that are worthy of death. I refuse not to die. So there, are, there is a case for capital punishment. Remember in Numbers, the bloodshed was affiliated with the land and its defilement. Look at what the Jews say, God's chosen people, at the crucifixion of the Lord. Matthew 27, 22. Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do with, then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. They don't give him a reason. They just say, Crucify him. And the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? But they cried the more, saying, Let him be crucified. Now watch this. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but rather that a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person, see it to it. He tried to take a shortcut. Watch their response. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be upon us and our children. Children that cut off. His blood be upon us. They didn't even shy from it. They openly admitted that his, we're crucifying him and his blood will be upon us and our children. And of course, spiritually, that applies to the whole world, but physically and nationally, that's to the Jews. The Romans helped in that as well, but the Jews were the ones that delivered over Jesus Christ. And I'm going to say this, and I don't want to offend, but maybe that's why their land is desert. The land is defiled by the blood innocent Jesus Christ that was slain because now the blood is upon them and their children, the blood is on that land crying out. I don't know. 
food starts running out here because our land's not producing, we should know that it's going to be a land that's been already filled with blood and bloodshed. <coughs> Wine in the Old Testament and New Testament represents blood. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 14. Butter of kine, that's like a type of cow, and milk of sheep with fat of lambs and rams, the breed of Bashan and goats with the fat of kidneys and wheat. Thou didst drink the pure blood of the great. Genesis 49, 11. Binding his foal unto the vine, and his ass is cold unto the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine and clothes in the blood of grapes. So blood is rep- wine is a representation of blood. Wine is a representation of blood, particularly Christ's blood that was shed for us. Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 to 29. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For it is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Now, that's important, the remission. We'll talk about that later. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Notice the blood of the grape, the fruit of the vine, and drinking it new. Okay, Jesus used grape juice not liquor and booze as a type of his blood. Mark chapter 14, verse 25. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine. What is the fruit of the vine? It's grape juice. Grape juice. Until that day I drink it new with you, new in the kingdom of God. There's a religious organization that uses booze. So it occurs to me to get drunk spiritual enlightenment. 1 Corinthians 10, 16. The communion is to be taken amongst saved, born-again Christians. Look at 1 Corinthians 10, 16. The cup of the blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? <clears throat> for we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. And you're only a partaker if you've been born again. If you're not saved, you're not part of the body. You're not part of the the bread. The bread which represents the Lord's body that was broken. The Lord's Supper or Communion is to be done at a local church gathering, not at home. 1 Corinthians 11.21 For in eating, everyone taketh before his own supper, and one is hungry and the other is drunken. What? Have ye not houses to eat and drink in? Or despise ye the church of God and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. 1 Corinthians eleven thirty three through 34 Wherefore, my brother, when you come together to eat, so when you're eating the Lord's Supper, you're supposed to come together. Tarry one for another, and if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together into condemnation, and, I will, and the rest I will set in order when I come. It is to be done with the elements found in the Lord's Last Supper. <clears throat> Christ's last supper. The elements are the bread, which is unleavened, and the fruit of the vine, the new wine. For I receive the Lord that which I deliver unto you, that the Lord Jesus at the same night which betrayed took bread, when he had given thanks and break it, said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you, do this in remembrance of me, after the same manner took the cup. So the bread and the cup, and in the cup was the wine, the new wine. Only saved uh, born again Christians ought to partake as per 1 Corinthians 10 16, being a part of one body. It is meant only for the body, but open communion may be practiced as you do not know for sure who are saved and lost. So if we did the Lord's Supper right now and there was somebody lost in here, we don't know that they're saved or lost. We administer to it to them, but it's meant for saved people only. Each person is to judge and examine themselves, uh, their walk in unconfessed sin, as to not receive condemnation and damnation. And that's not damnation to hell, but it's condemnation. Um, 1 Corinthians 11.28, 
but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. The Lord is un- uses unleavened bread. 1 Corinthians 5, 6, your growing is not good, knowing not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Leaven is a type of sin. It's uh, the yeast that rises in the bread. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even our, even Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. And you're supposed to do it as oft as you would in remembrance of the Lord. It's a memorial supper, not a sacrament. 1 Corinthians 11.25, after the same manner, also took the cup when he had supped, saying, This is the New Testament of my blood. Do this as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. You're supposed to do it in remembrance of the Lord. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show the Lord's death till he come. In the Old Testament, the blood of animals atoned for the soul. There's power in the blood. We sing that song. There is power, power. Well, there's a special power in the blood. In the Old Testament, it atoned. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Atonement means to pay up, all right, to pay for wrongdoing. So when you sinned, you had to shed the blood of animals and it atoned. It, it, it covered, it paid, temporarily paid for the sin. The blood of shed animals was only a temporary covering. Most sin, not all, were purged. And of course, in Hebrews it says, For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the blood and the people, saying, This blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged. Now, the word purge means to clean or cleanse by extracting the dirt and their filth. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. Now, remission means to cover. If you think of remission, you think of cancer. Cancer goes in remission, but does it necessarily mean that it's gone? When cancer goes in remission, does it necessarily mean it's completely gone? No, it's in hiding, it's covering. So the blood, when the blood was sprinkled, and when it was shed from the animals in the Old Testament, it temporarily covered the sin. It wasn't completely done away with. Because it says in Hebrews 10.4, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. And the reason why is because there is an annual, annual yearly remembrance. Hebrews 10.2-3, For then they would not have ceased to be offered. Because the worshippers once purged, clean, cleansed, should have no more conscience of sins, but in those sacrifices there were remembrance again made every year. So every year they had to re-sacrifice, they had to make another atonement. Now let me ask you something, when you got saved, did you get saved over and over again? No. Because of 1 John 1, 7. Okay? 1 John 1, 7 and also Hebrews 10. The Lord sacrificed once for all. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Okay? Cleanseth us from all sin. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7 says, In whom we have redemption. Now, redemption means to be purchased. We're purchased back when we get saved. We're purchased back. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. As one of the ten plagues of Egypt, Moses turned the waters of Egypt into blood. Exodus 4 9. Moses put blood upon the sides and upper posts of the doorways to prevent the death angel from killing the firstborn in Israel. Exodus 12 7. I got to go real quick here. Uh, The whore of the one world religion, Revelation 17, will be drunk with the blood of the martyrs of God and will be given more blood to drink in the tribulation. Revelation 17 and 18. In the tribulation, a third of the waters will become blood. Revelation 8 8, 11 6. In the tribulation, hail mixed with blood will fall. Uh, Revelation 8.4. During the great battle of Armageddon, blood will run 1,600 furlongs up to the horse's bridle, which is about four feet high. That's a lot of bloodshed. The Lord comes back on a horse, and his vesture will be dipped in blood. 
Revelation 19, 13. For sake of time, I'll give you the passages, and uh, I won't be able to quote them. Uh, as I've said now, and I'll say before, there's a lot of blood in the Bible. The Bible's a bloody book. In the midst of all the horror, action, and war movies that we're so susceptible today, people still have a problem, and always will have a problem with the blood. It is the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses. It is the blood of Jesus Christ, Christ that redeems. It is the blood of Jesus Christ that remits. It is the blood of Jesus Christ that saves. Why do people have a problem? Because it's spiritual. The NIV, NASV, the New Living Bible, the New Revised Standard Version, RSV, TLB, CEV, and the ISV remove and change countless verses in the Bible dealing with blood and the doctrinal assertions that we as Christians hold true on the blood. Are you washing the blood of the Lamb? Not according to the NIV, ASV, and RSV. Revelation chapter 1, 5 completely takes out washed in the blood. It is the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, that cleanseth us all from all sin. I'm going to have to forego any questions today because of time. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Now, if you have any questions, ask me. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your blood shed, Lord, for our sins, to save our souls, Lord. I thank you for this book, Lord. I pray that we wouldn't forget blood that was uh, shed for the atonement of our sins, Lord, and no longer through the blood of bulls and goats, but through your blood. And Lord, we thank you for the Old Testament giving us the pattern. So we thank you for your son coming bodily and shedding his blood. And Lord, we thank you for it. In Jesus' name we do pray.